talking about the horrendous destruction that is going on in Southeast Asia where peatlands and rainforests are being uh, destroyed uh, in order to grow palm oil and to have palm oil with palm oil being increasingly used as a feedstock for bioenergy including uh, biodiesel. You know the United Nations have confirmed quite clearly that it's biofuel starting to affect the price of food right around right throughout the globe but particularly for the poorest nations and the poorest countries having to then have to import grains. Um, the other thing, unfortunately, that has also happened in the past year is that we've seen absolutely astronomical investment by the biofuel industry. So whilst awareness, awareness is beginning to, you know, to increase that this may be not the answer, uh, we are seeing uh, multi-billion dollars investments going in by the biofuel industry. To the main thing to remember about agrofuels is that this is not just a market that we are helpless about. This is a market that would collapse tomorrow without government targets and incentives. Agrofuels are not at the moment commercially viable. Um, this is exclusively driven by, I would say, corporate lobbying. Um, Getting, getting policy strategies in place to, you know, boost the sector, boost the sector, you know, it's, so what we really have to focus on is two things. Firstly, you know, we have to stop the policies that are driving it, and particularly the biofuel targets in Europe, in the UK. And secondly, I think, you know, what we have to do is directly expose and target, you know, the industry that is behind it. Um. There's very little that would um, make me get on, onto an aeroplane and fly. Um, for nearly six years I haven't done that. And uh, we had a request for an international delegation to come together as an emergency in Colombia because of the amount of devastation that the uh, palm oil companies are causing there. Particularly uh, Federation Palm Oil, Fed Palm Oil, one of the central organizations that's driving deforestation and putting up monocultures of, of oil palm. And um, when we were out there, we had a, communities coming from literally hundreds of miles around, and they're coming on foot, they're coming by bicycle, they're coming by local bus, and they've never, they've never been in a conference like this before, they've never seen PowerPoint. It's astonishing to meet these people, wonderful people. But when you heard, and I have a habit of translating as they spoke Spanish, when I heard the, their story, it was just really heartrending to hear what they'd gone through. And uh, what I what I wanted to say, was, what was communicated with me to me was that because it's cheaper for the palm oil companies, well, it's difficult for them to go in and actually deforest because the Andean tropical forest is the most biodiverse forest on Earth. It's even more biodiverse than, than the, the Amazon rainforest. So there are biological uh, diversity implications there. But on top of that, um, it's actually more cost effective to take land off, off um, local communities and displace them and use that land for palm oil than to deforest and, and have other implications to deal with. So that's what they've been doing for over a decade now. They've been displacing local communities and then they bring in, then they displace, displace communities elsewhere and bring them in as migrants so that you've now got a displaced community working that land. That means they've got no local ties, no cultural ties, they can't form themselves together in protest groups. And they're also locked into bonded labour, which means they're working these 14-hour shifts, they've got targets to reach, and if they don't reach the targets, they don't get paid. And when we went out to the local communities, these were emaciated people who were clearly bodies that looked much older than their years. Um, people I was working with, or we were working with as a delegation, were the communities that had returned now from previous years, this was sort of like something like 18 months ago, had been displaced, and had come back to their original lands, and were now being surrounded by the military and also the paramilitary. The parliamentary being the non-government um, element of um, armed um, and armed, armed force, and um, the difficulty they were, they were facing was, was that they were constantly under threat. And when they first returned, several people were shot at. Um, one person who was uh, a village leader was telling me that um, he was he was taking his family, his children away because he realised it was no longer safe and that he, he couldn't hold on any longer. He took all his belongings. And as he walked along the river, trying to take his family out, escaping at night, his children out, he came across his body, and this body had his hands tied behind its back, and his head had been severed, and the stomach opened up, and the head put inside this person's stomach. 
and he obviously horrified covered to turn the children away walked forward and then as he, what they do is they take the body into the forest or under whatever shelter they can and try to just cover it with earth because it was too quick to do a proper burial too urgent and when he looked at the face inside the belly of, of this person it was his brother and it was really heartrending to hear and there were several stories like this so and even when we were there we had passports taken off at one point and turned a little bit later and another time we ordered off the vehicle several people ordered off some people that were made to stay on and there were clearly attempts at being quite menacing towards us um, but staying with them we had a sort of minor success in so much as um, um, a vice minister signed a, an agreement to say that whatever land had been taken back by these peasant folk that they were sheep and they began a process of uh, cutting the palm and removing the palms that had been planted by the plantation owners or the plantation runners I should say and now they've started to starting to grow their own crops on the land again but it's a tremendously volatile situation um, probably a link that we could make, any of you know the, the Wolf's organisation, the, uh, um, where people work on organic farms. Um, I, I'm wondering if, if anybody's got a link where we could get some of those people across the support of this kind of uh, reinstatement of local communities in Columbia and other places. I think it's a tremendously useful thing to do. But I suppose just to sort of sum up, um, when we displace people off the land like that, not only is there an immense humanitarian crisis, but there's also an environmental crisis because those people have to live somewhere. If they're on the move as migrants, they get picked up and put into other, other farm plantations. They're only safe places to go back into the forest, and that means more felling and, 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 and returning to their old customised lifestyle where they can carve out a territory and, and, and grow their own food. Of course, with the best will in the world, that's what you want to do, even if it's of all the destroying habitat. So, either way, we destroy our ecosystems as a result of this. We call it agrofuels. This is a quote uh, from MST, the Landless Workers Movement, which I believe is the biggest single NGO in uh, globally. Uh, it's, they've got 11 million members. Uh, what they're saying is we can't call this a biofuels program. We certainly can't call it a biodiesel program. Such phrases use the prefix bio to subtly imply that the energy in question comes from life in general. This is illegitimate and manipulative. We need to find a term in every language that describes the situation more accurately, a term like agrofuel. This term um, refers specifically to energy created from plant production grown for agriculture. Now, I think it's really important that we start using the different terms. I know there's a lot of people who are saying, oh, but I use biodiesel and it's waste vegetable or oil from my local chippy. We should actually stop calling, the, you know, calling things like palm oil, diesel from palm oil and waste vegetable oil. We should stop using the same terms. We should speak of waste vegetable oil or, you know, fuels from true waste and agrofuels because the two are completely different, you know, fuels from true waste or something, you know, there's not that much of it, but what there is we should use and we should support. Agrofuels are really substantially different. It's ironic that agrofuels are being sold as uh, a climate change solution because when we're looking at the whole, I don't just call it life cycle, but at the whole full picture of emissions involved, uh, we are speaking of far greater. Um, a far greater amount of carbon being released than could possibly uh, be displaced in terms of displacing, uh, in displacing petrol, relatively modest quantities of petrol or diesel. Those are, which I'll speak about uh, in a bit, fires, uh, regular fires that burn every year now in um, Indonesia in particular, to some extent in Malaysia as well, where palm oil companies are setting um, basically using where, where they, are, they are basically getting con getting having to get new concessions to drain peatlands and um, to convert to convert it into new palm oil plantations uh, what happens is that once a peat is drained firstly it just goes dry and it burns like tinder and secondly just setting fire to the whole to, to the whole area is by far the cheapest and most efficient way to clear land for oil plants it's illegal but it happens all the time there's a new study from friends of the earth uh, netherlands and two indonesian ngos that you know shows how it's routinely used uh, by uh, what's probably the biggest farmer company worldwide wilma group uh, despite them saying that they would never ever do such a thing